so glad you're with us here on Faith Works Live. Rebecca Haney is my name, and it is just a joy to be able to talk about the big things here on this uh, little slice of eternity. It is, it's a difficult thing to talk about the ugliness, the ugly reality of this broken world that we live in. And uh, I think it's so necessary, predominantly because in order to know the truth, in order to speak the truth, you're going to automatically be calling out the lies that are all around us. Um, and God has put such a good design in place for the family. Is it any wonder that the enemy of our souls is going to want to attack all the things that God says are true and beautiful and lovely and wonderful and praiseworthy? Um, yeah, that's kind of his MO. He comes to steal, kill and destroy. So yeah, no wonder. And we have armor for just such a time as this. So today I consider to be kind of an armor up conversation, which is perhaps the ultimate compliment I can pay to our special guest. Kimberly Ells is our guest. She is our, the author of the invincible family. She has testified before the UN. Um, she is a researcher on family policy. Uh, she details international threats to children and the family. She's also a wife and mom of five kids, and she is on our airwaves to describe and, and to debunk and shine the light on some of the lies that we may have believed without even knowing it, and a rather sinister agenda that's being perpetuated against the family. Uh, like I said, you're going to want to buckle up and hang on for this one. Kimberly, I'm so glad that you could join us today. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, what is uh, the story behind, before we get into the book, how did you mm -hmm. get here? What is uh, the reason, what was the catalyst for you to uh, join into this particular fight? Well, it was, it was about 10 years ago, actually, at this point. And um, two things, two things kind of happened. First of all, as, as a mom, I began to ponder deeply up upon what that means to, to be a mother and the purpose of the family and all these kinds of things. And I came to the conclusion, it kind of struck me one day that um, motherhood is the prime position of power in mm -hmm. the world. And that's not often the way that motherhood is spoken about. Motherhood is very often spoken about as a, a, a menial a, a task, full of menial tasks and kind of a doormat position. I mean, there's, you know, on Mother's Day, maybe we talk about the honoring our mothers, but by and large in the public square, uh, motherhood is seen as something lesser, something that's kind of unworthy of your time. If only you could get a real job, you know, a real way to spend your time, that kind of thing. And um, so I, I was like, wait a minute, that that's not what this is. Motherhood is actually not only a powerful position, but I feel like the powerful position. And, and maybe we'll get into a little bit of why, but sure. so I decided, I decided to, I decided that story needed to be told that someone needed to be talking about that angle on motherhood and family. Uh, and then a little bit more sinister than that. I, um, ran across a document online that, uh, really upset me. It was a, it was a document that I came to understand was published by International Planned Parenthood Federation. Ah, oh, the source and, of all bad ideas. Right. So, and this was an especially bad one. And, and it was something I wasn't familiar with before. Of course, we're all familiar with the fact that Planned Parenthood uh, uh, promotes abortion and performs abortion um, across the world. Um, but what I didn't realize at the time was that they also pushed uh, a children's sexual rights narrative. And so the document I found was called Exclaim. And it de detailed what are supposedly uh, the wonderful sexual rights of children, of, of youth. And there's like these 10 principles. It's this well laid out uh, document, very professionally done, using the language of rights to describe um, what children should be after sexually. And uh, I, I was- That in and of itself is shocking. To, to well, even I was hear shocked. that phrase. Yeah. I, I, as a mom, I, I was shocked. And just as a citizen, I thought, okay, uh, first of all, is this real? And I looked into it and realized that it was, and then realized, okay, well, there's my fight. You just found the hill I'm going to die on, you mm -hmm. know, and, and that mo most parents are willing to die and you're not going to sexualize my kid, you know? And so um, that's how I kind of got catapulted into mm -hmm. even the public sphere at all. And I had no intention to write a book at the, as, at the outset. I had done some writing and was looking to contribute, but um, from that point, then I joined forces with, and I think God brought me together with some people at Family Watch International quite miraculously, with, you know, within days. And I realized that they had been fighting this very fight um, at the global level for for some years. And uh, so I thought, 
I decided that's, that's where I wanted to, to put my energies and my firepower. And so, um, that's how I, that's how I got started. And that's what eventually, you know, some years later led to the book. And the book, once again, is called The Invincible Family, which I absolutely love. Um, I love the ferocity of that. I love the worldview mm -hmm. of that. And that's, it's true. We believe mm -hmm. that if if we truly believe as Christians that God's design is very good and that, you know, any that anything that the enemy throws at us is less, it's less powerful, it's less effective, it's based on a lie, and therefore it cannot stand. It must, mm -hmm. it, it must of necessity be defeated um, by its very nature. Then I think we have to have that approach as we move forward, and not just in this conversation, but in our lives in general. We can walk in in the firm, sure knowledge that victory is is assured. Um, but it certainly has the feeling as someone that has become awakened to this. I'm a mom as well. We've got six kiddos in our house and four of them are under four uh, <laughs> or three of them are under four. Sorry. And uh, they, I almost forgot myself for a second. There's the... <laughs> it's crazy over the Haney house, but the, the knowledge that I would have, that these would be the battles that we would have. I could never have predicted this. You know, when, when I was growing up, that the realities that we live in now, where the people in authority authority can't even tell us what a woman is what a man is and and that is not accidental and that's a, a large part of what your book mm -hmm. details is that there's a specific agenda behind this kind of cultural confusion it is an all intentional none of this is being done by accident and there is a specific and targeted attack on god's design for the family can mm -hmm. can we talk a little bit about that Yes. And I agree with you that even, even just a few years ago, if you would have asked me what I thought, what I thought was going to be the prime battle in society, you know, I, by the way, personally, I am a believer in God and Jesus Christ. The book that I've written, I've written purposely from a largely non-religious standpoint, because okay. I think we need to come to the table, um, with non-religious arguments in the end, uh, all arguments that are true align with God, with God and his, his principles. So, you know, and, and natural law, law is in alignment with God himself. So, so there is that element, but I think we, just so people know, I, I will speak of my faith, but the book is, I hopeful use, useful to a very wide range of people because it is largely non-religious. But um, even if you would have asked me a few years ago, what would be the battle, you know, as, as we seem to be approaching what appears to be perhaps what people would call the end of the world what what would be the main um areas of disagreement and you know we might have said something like you know various doctrines that people disagree on or, or you know belief in god itself uh himself or um you know trying to put down religion specifically but i i would not have guessed and i think most people on both si sides of the aisle would not have guessed that one of the major fights that we'd be fighting is whether or not men and women exist as physical classes of people. That's where we are. And that is one of the most, you know, everyone knows now it's one of the most uh, divisive uh, topics of conversation. And, and uh, it's incredible because it's a physical reality and we're not able now to agree on that physical reality. So, um, so we find ourselves in this really interesting place where a lot of different al alliances, I think more of different groups and people are aligning that, that may not have before because the fight is a different fight than what we expected. The opposition is coming from, from different and more sneaky ways. So, um, but so going back to the second part of what, what you asked, um, basically where, where is this coming from? Right. So, um, I'll refer back to the document that I that I mentioned that first brought me to the table and a quote from that document I want to share because it kind of frames this whole issue. Sure. So International Planned Parenthood Federation in that document says that sexuality and sexual pleasure are important parts of being human for everyone, no matter what age, no matter if you're married or not, and no matter if you want to have children or not. I believe that's the direct quote. And then oh they go goodness. on to say that governments and leaders have a duty to protect to protect and fulfill all sexual rights for everyone that's so what they're saying say what now all sexual so, rights for ev include for uh, without any sort of age limit well yes and in the in the paragraph that i quoted before that they specifically say at all ages they specifically they, there are no limitations and so if you see it laid bare like that most people 
certainly most religious people, but I think even just most people disagree with that statement that people have a human right to sexual pleasure at all stages of their life, especially if you're a parent that makes you uncomfortable. And, um, and rightly so. And rightly so, because we as parents are are put in a position to be protectors of our children, especially sexual protector, to protect their innocence and to um, not purposely expo- expose them to the, the filth and degrading things of the world, to, to keep them insulated from that as much as we can, and to help them understand that sex and, sex and sexuality isn't one of those dark and horrible things. It's actually a gift from God. And to frame it to our children in in those terms, it's the thing that creates human life, that we live in families on purpose because it's the way that works the best. It doesn't always work perfectly, but it works the best. And so um, anyway, so but what you have to realize is that if this is the, the, the quote that I took from that that article is not just a standalone. So that's what brought me to the table. But then when I went to the United Nations, I began to understand that that sexual philosophy is what undergirds almost all of the global policy that's being put forward, especially family policy, but really it undergirds all else. In fact, I read an article just this past week that from uh, written by a leader of a UN agency wherein they said that sexual the issue of sexual rights is a cornerstone of the sustainable development goals which of course are the UN goals for the world and that's how they see it okay so why is that why would they be targeting sex why would they be using sex mm-hmm. in, in relation to kids specifically right that's a and, that's an excellent question Okay. So, and I've, this is what I've been diving into. And so you can learn from their own resources, why they do this. And also from deduce from what they say, like for instance, in other uh, literature from Planned Parenthood, they say that they specifically target youth because that gives them the greatest uh, opportunity to influence lives for decades going forward. Sure. Right. You got to get to the kids and get them young. You have to get to the children. So, and if you do, and and I want to address that more broadly in a minute, but just about children, but specifically on the issue of sex, if you get to children early with the message that sex is simply a human right, that they have a right to sexual pleasure, that sets them on a totally different course than a family oriented, I'm pursuing relationships in order to build long lasting relationships that will then form a marriage wherein I can welcome children into that marriage and help to not just populate the world, but fill the world with light and truth by teaching my children the truth. That's a totally different, that worldview of, the reason I'm dating at all is to find someone that I can build my life with and to build, to raise children with, but instead, and sex is a huge part of that and an important part of that. But instead, if we tell the children, sex is something you have a right to outside of the bonds of marriage. It doesn't matter if you ever want to have kids, if you ever want to get married, which is all mentioned in the the document I just read. um, That's a totally different path to send children down and particularly young women. And then if we add to that, what they say is an, an additional sexual right is specifically safe for women is, is abortion to then eliminate your own children instead mm. of cherishing them. You have corrupted a young girl's mind in such a way that the family itself is, there's somewhat of a bomb placed at the core of the family from the outset. You know, if, if you corrupt sex, you corrupt the family because Mm. sex is what creates families. And so that's why, that's one reason why anyway, there's this voracious push for sex. It's, it's not just, you know, getting people to give into their lusts, you know, uh, for whatever other reasons, it's because it destroys the family because, because it, it gets young people to think differently about sexual relations in such a way that it will be family destructive rather than family building. Mm-hmm. And it will also be destructive to to them personally, particularly for young women um, who buy into this ideology that they have a right to have. First of all, why would we teach young women that is somehow great or a right that they should have sex with random boys who don't care about their long-term welfare? 
Right. It's, it's inherently is, victim. We start victimizing ourselves under the guise of our own empowerment. Yes. And it's that's cloaked in the language of women's rights. And but it, it's a high, it's a complete hijacking of, of women's rights. And it's a disservice to women and young women to tell them, oh, yeah, that's what you do if you're a free and empowered woman is you have sex with men who don't love you. That's mm. that's ridiculous. What what we need to be, we need to change that narrative and we need to be teaching our young women that uh, that chastity is the thing that protects them most that's what empowers them the most and when a when a young man approaches them they need to do that with respect and reverence for what she is mm -hmm. again that's maybe going a little bit deeper but that's that's what we where we need to change our our culture and that starts in in our family so anyway so um this mass there's this massive push for sex and it's it's all about destroying the family and it's highly funded and very well coordinated, which is what I learned, at, you know, actually attending the UN for myself. Well, let's go there next, because I think there's a lot of us that are have been awake, unpleasantly awakened to the mm -hmm. fact that there is this sexual confusion, gender confusion, all the lies that that you uh, just clearly laid out there in particular towards young women, but young men, too. And we can get into that maybe here after the break. Um, we'll talk a little bit about how we are we are so steeped in a culture of lies that I think even in the church, we start to believe some of these things. We start to perpetuate it or we don't mm -hmm. fight back against it, at least as strongly as we should. But again, this is not accidental. And we talk about kind of the, the cosmic reality of this, right? That there's a, a giant war of worldviews that we're all stepping into. This is a spiritual mm -hmm. battle. And that's where I see, you know, primarily I talk about things from that perspective. But there's also a very, as you mentioned, very highly funded and very powerful agenda at play here that is promoting this. So it's not like everyone mm -hmm. just woke up and said, hey, let's go to Berkeley and let's, you know, come up with crazy ideas and rainbow hair and like, let's just try this out an experiment. Now, this mm -hmm. is this has been a long time coming and is being very heavily pushed that we inculcate our children and then the instructors of our children and the voices that our children mm -hmm. are listening to, that we are listening to now for several generations. And I wonder if you could maybe give some examples of what you're talking about um, that you've seen either firsthand or in your research. Yes, absolutely. Well, one of the main, so, okay, so Planned Parenthood and UN agencies have embraced this sexual rights ideology. They promote it, and, but how are they going to actually get that to children? Most parents aren't going to teach their children those things. So how are they going to get this message? And so the main way uh, so far that has been employed is through com what they, what's called comprehensive sexuality education. And um, while I'm not necessarily opposed to some sexuality education done appropriately and age appropriately, uh, what we're talking about here is uh, a very radical form of sex, sex ed that that promotes sex from what i've said from a, a sexual rights perspective teaching children that it is their sexual right to pursue pleasure in, in on these different things um also to promote abortion and now we've an, another major arm of cse or comprehensive sexuality education is gender ideology so all these things are wrapped up and packaged in quite an appealing way uh to school districts you know and and uh education entities across the world. And so comprehensive sexuality education comes dressed in the language of human rights, tells people, oh, it's age appropriate, um, all these things. And, and so then schools tend to welcome it in, unaware, in, at least in some cases, of really what some of the uh, curriculum is. Now, it's not all terrible. It, that's why it's effective and sneaky is because a lot of it is actually fine. But one of the efforts that I have undertaken, it, it, along with Family Watch International and several, several other groups, is looking into specific um, comprehensive sexuality education programs and taking out quotes from them, analyzing them according to this 15 point analysis. And uh, what you'll see in the book, when you read one of the chapters, I promise they're not all this difficult, not, you know, dismal to read, but there is one chapter on comprehensive sexuality education that gives examples from the, these uh, um, programs. And uh, in all honesty, I left out the worst of it because I didn't want to be part of spreading that, mm -hmm. but I, but I paint the picture pretty effectively. And then uh, if you go to a website called CSE, stopcse.org, stands for stop comprehensive sexuality education.org. 
Um, what you can find there is, is actually several helpful tools for parents or others who are concerned ab about this. There's a the first thing that will pop up will be a, a documentary about the children's sexual rights agenda. There's a, a shorter version, a longer version. I'd recommend you watch them, not in the company of any children, of course. Um, to 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 really see what we're up against, and then um, there's also links on there. If you click on CSE Exposed, there's links to actual curriculum um, that's being pushed by the United Nations, by International Planned Parenthood Federation, by CICAS, by all these other sexual rights groups, and so you can see um, what what they're producing, and that's helpful. Just not just for you to know, but so that then that you can use that information as you fight this in your local uh, legislature or or uh, school district, because the fight is coming. If it hasn't come yet, it is coming to your area, and so um, where I hope my book is helpful. It was I've actually taken my book with me, you know, to to testify because there's examples in there. And like I said, at stopcse.org, people can find more information. And then you can click on, there's a, a map, you can click on your state and see what's being done, how you might be able to participate, what the laws are saying in your state so that you can um, oppose comprehensive sexuality education in, mm -hmm. in all its forms. So I've been very specific about that, that effort, the CSE, because it is one of the most highly debated and battled issues at the United Nations. Isn't that surprising? It of is. all the things that um, supposedly the best and brightest people of the world come together, the, one of the main things that they fight about is comprehensive sexuality education, which shows you why it is key. That's why they say it's a cornerstone to their philosophy, which is a, a globalist, uh, basically socialist, communist philosophy in the end. It, it is absolutely key to what they're trying to do. And so they fight tooth and nail uh, to to push comprehensive sexuality education on children everywhere. And mm -hmm. the moms of the world are not having that. No, ma'am. <laughs> That's a big old no. You're not, yeah. not going to be able to get to my kids. No. Right. And I care enough about my neighbor's kids and my community, you know, the, the kids that I know and love that, uh, no, we have to stand in the gap. And the fight is, mm -hmm. if we're not willing to fight about something like this, then I, I mean, I, then I guess that's the end of the world as we know, <laughs> then you can't, if you can't stand up for this and you can't stand up for anything. So this is a worthy fight. As you said, you know, we're willing to die on, on this hill because we have to protect our children. Um, mm -hmm. Kimberly Ells is our guest. You're listening to Faith Works Live. We believe that it works. There is a targeted effort to undermine, to attack, and uh, to really dismantle the family. We'll talk a little bit more about why. Again, why would that be? If not the family, if not God's design for the family, then what else are they hoping will take its place? Like, what would be the motivations for some of this? This would destabilize and destroy. None of this sounds good. So what are they hoping to put in its place? And what is the motivation behind the other side? agenda and then how of course can we fight back because there are real uh, solutions there's a real part for all of us to play to protect the kids this is a fight we must win and Kimberly is going to discuss that with us her book is The Invincible Family and uh, I highly recommend that you get a copy it is well researched it is highly footnoted again not necessarily warm and fuzzy read but parts of it are very encouraging so we're going to talk about the good the bad uh, and the bible when we come back you're listening to Faith Works Live now is the time to stand for life. For 50 years, Iowans for Life has been the longest standing nonprofit pro life organization in Iowa, and they stand strong today as pulse life advocates. They believe in defending the defenseless. And that's what we need now, a new generation to value the sanctity of all human life from fertilization till natural death. They advocate at the Capitol, in classrooms, at events across the state of Iowa on abortion, on family planning, on physician-assisted suicide, euthanasia, basically every issue where the culture is so contrary to what God calls us to. They're standing in the gap as defenders of the defense and they're a voice for the voiceless because they believe in the value of life. And if you do too, sign up for their newsletter and get involved today at pulseforlife.org. That's pulseforlife.org. At FaithWorks Live, we're proud to partner with InterVisions Healthcare. In unplanned pregnancy and STD situations, they offer help and hope. It's all confidential and it's all free. If women are in a crisis pregnancy situation, they know that they can get real help 
at Intervisions. Free pregnancy testing, free STD testing, free ultrasounds as well to see that inner vision. Because women deserve the truth about their bodies, about their baby, about all of their options. And if a woman has gone down the road of seeking abortion through medication and she regrets that decision, Intervisions also offers abortion pill reversal procedure, which is a life-saving, <laughs> miraculous um, option to have right here in our own community. Intervisions Healthcare, well worth supporting, providing those free services to women in crisis pregnancy. You can call them 24 hours a day at 515-440-2273. That's 515-440-2273. So glad you're with us here on Faith Works Live, and I'm glad that you signed up for, I think, one of those maybe eye-opening, maybe life-changing conversations um, with Kimberly Ells. Uh, she is the author of The Invincible Family, and the subtitle will wake you up, Why the Global Campaign to Crush Motherhood and Fatherhood Can't Win. And if you're just joining us, I mean, you have to go back to the beginning of the podcast and listen to the full conversation. Kimberly has been doing her research for years now on family policy. She's spoken at the United Nations all across the country about the international. So this, we're talking about global agendas uh, to target children and the family in particular regarding uh, their a redefinition basically of not only who we are um, and the fight, we see this in the fight for uh, quote unquote gender equality, the redefinition now of gender, basically the uh, the abolition of, of gender and the inculcation of gender fluidity. All of this confusion is surrounding the idea of sexual rights for children, which basically, and if that makes you do a double take, it should. That's It's disgusting to think about the ways in which that can be used to abuse our children, to, to have them see themselves first as sexual beings, and then to say we're not allowed to protect our children from the advances of those who see them primarily as sexual beings slash prey. And this is very real. I don't mean to overstate the case. I know these days you're not allowed to call people groomers. Otherwise, you get slapped with censorship. But if we're talking about actual predatory behavior, an actual predatory agenda that exposes and and uh, targets our children, then I think we have to call a spade a spade. And Kimberly, we were discussing all the lies that are out there in the culture, but this is not just, again, experimental. This isn't, you know, people throwing stuff up against the wall to see what sticks in this new world, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, a brave new world. This is a particular, I'm not sure if I should say conspiracy because nobody likes a conspiracy theorist, but I am a pretty mm -hmm. good coincidence noticer. Yeah. I am. It is interesting that this agenda is being promoted at the highest levels on a global scale. And and why on earth would that be? Let's just say if you're skeptical, let's just say this this could be true. And you have to read some more of uh, Kimberly's footnotes in order to see. Yes, there is actual evidence for this. Um, why would that be? Why would people in power be promoting um, this type of destruction of the family? And, and what do they seek to replace it with? Uh, great question. And so I have to go back just a little bit and talk about, so in a, in a nutshell, people are trying to destroy the family because it's the family that stands in the way of their kind of global agenda. It, it's been said, you know, between the totalitarian, totalitarian state and then in, in the individual stands the family. That is the protective um, level layer that kind of has been put in place by design. And so, but if you look a little bit deeper, and th this is what I talk about in the book, um, also just for your listeners, the last half of the book is more of these kind of alarming things and kind of exposing these international threats to the family. The first part of the book is actually super <laughs> uplifting and it exposes some of the beauty of the family, which I chose to do purposely, because if you understand the function and beauty of the family, then it matters why there's these global attacks against it. It makes some some sense. So I want to go there just for a minute. You're asking why? Sure. Well, for instance, mothers, think about it. So philosophers through the ages have pointed out where true power comes from. And for instance, Aristotle said the destiny of nations lies in the education of youth. Lenin said, give me four years to teach the children and the, the seed I have sown will never be uprooted. And, and I could go on and on with examples of people saying whoever has the, the allegiance of the young wins the future. In fact, Hitler himself say he who owns the youth gains the future. Okay. So 
What does that mean for mothers? If you think about it, when a baby is born, it always comes to who? Mama. A mother. Mm-hmm. A mom. Hopefully in tandem with the father. That's sure. how it should be. But regardless of that, it always comes to a mother. The baby lands in her lap. It's part of her lap. You know, and there's no, there's no debate really of who this baby belongs to, unless mm-hmm. you're talking in the case of reproductive technology. But aside from that, the baby belongs to its mother, which puts the mother, all mothers in a position of profound influence mm-hmm. over their children, which means that women are in a position of profound influence over every person that is ever born. And so when I look, when I go to the UN, and I go to different events, very often I hear these women ranting, you know, uh, saying, I look around and I don't see women in enough in positions of power. I say, that's because you're not looking in the right place. Mm -hmm. Every mother is in a position of profound power. You don't have to be the leader of a country to exert profound and long lasting power. And so I spend a, a while in the book talking about that. The first chapter talks about the power of belonging. And because if who does a little baby know best at first? His mother. Who does he love best at first? His mother. And then father comes on the scene. And the, then the two of them together give balance to the to the child's life. But it's the mother first. Mm-hmm. And so she is, it could be said then that she who owns the youth gains the future. So in my opinion, mothers have been largely the masters of the destiny of the world because motherhood underlies all other structures and and more importantly um it's motherhood itself how it happens that the the baby is produced from the body of the woman and is attached to her by an actual cord and all these things it's it establishes private possessorship private belonging which is an exact opposition to people who have global totalitarian aims excuse me So because private belonging is the opposite of uh, collectivism, right? right? And and just briefly in the book, I spent a chapter going back and exploring um, the writings of Frederick Engels, who is the right hand man of Karl Marx, one of the, the earliest founders of modern socialism. And he specifically says that we need to remove babies from the care of their mothers. And and of course, he couches it in the language of to free women. We need to free women from this oppressive position. Mm -hmm. But what it really does is free children up so that other less noble forces can usurp them, right? So what I'm getting at here is that the reason why there's such a ferocious attack against the family is because the the family is the most powerful entity in the world and other forces want that power they want that power and in order to get it they have to break down the family they have to uh insult motherhood they have to break families apart so that mothers aren't as able and fathers Mm -hmm. to influence their children on the profound and basic level that they should because it's really mothers and fathers in those first precious years of life that establish for the child what's right and what's wrong Mm-hmm. what's worth living and dying for what's noble right. and not noble and 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 so mothers and fathers in in a particularly unique way mothers establish the foundational beliefs of the world and from what i've seen and what i outline in the book there are for- forces who very much don't want mothers to stay in that position and so they have to remove them in various ways and i talk about the various ways that's happening mm-hmm. right well and w- thinking about all the lessons that we learn at our inner mother's laps and at mm-hmm. our father's knee right that uh, mm-hmm. you learn about love you learn about compassion you learn truth you learn right from wrong and uh I mean, isn't it interesting that there are forces that are very interested in power and control that would not want that to be the case? Why? Mm -hmm. Probably because they hate competition. Um, and we've, I mean, just even looking as, as women and as moms about the lies about, uh, womanhood, motherhood under the guise of empowerment that Mm -hmm. we have believed. I mean, these folks are, are the enemies of the family, um, are masters of the euphemism. They talk about our empowerment. They talk about Mm -hmm. our freedom, but they also are lying to us to tell us that our, our worth and our, is in our career is in our accomplishments Mm -hmm. that way that we have to get outside the home. You know, the quicker you can get back into your career, you don't want to lose 
those, you know, all of those accomplishments by being burdened with the baby. And of course, ultimately we've believed that babies are burdens in our culture, such that we're, mm -hmm. we're exterminating them in to the tune of millions every single year. I mean, the, when they are the, the most brilliant blessing that we could ever possibly have. And, and you mentioned the, the private belonging aspect of parenthood. And that's something that's, that seems rather self-evident when you stop and think about it, but we have to probably redefine and stand for a lot of what once were self-evident things. Mm -hmm. And I remember, you know, back in, in, I don't know, the way back machine of like nine years ago, maybe nine, 10 years ago. And there was a statement that went kind of viral uh, in the early days of YouTube by um, an MSNBC host called Melissa Harris Perry. And maybe you're mm -hmm. familiar with her. And she was sort of speaking the quiet part out loud when she was talking about how children should not be seen as belonging to their parents. She thought mm -hmm. that was a lie and that now we should move past and progress because she's progressive. We have to move past. And, and that was the era of Obama. We have to move past this idea of children belonging to their parents and taking the it takes a village mantra quite mm -hmm. literally because that's <laughs> what she believes as a collectivist, that they're all our children. They belong to all of us. And that it, you know, if you look past kind of the touchy feely you know, elements of that, that is really an insidious lie. That is an attack on the family. And you detail some of those as well. I know there's a several feminists that are very blatantly saying we have to dismantle the family in mm -hmm. order to accomplish our agenda because their agenda is really not about empowering women as much as it is just about kind of making us all into neutral units. Right. And if, case in point, I have this new book out by Sophie Lewis, Abolish the Family. And she, I talk about her in the book. This is new since I wrote the book, actually. She had an, another book called Feminism Against Family. And she, she That's real says, subtle. Yeah, it's becoming <laughs> more, more blatant. And in the book, I illustrate how this is, while it may be considered fringe now, it is on the verge of flooding the world through our schools, this ideology. And it goes back and I detail there's a there's a key feminist from the 1970s and her philosophies are becoming really important to understand right now. And there's a couple of things I want to highlight. There's, again, there's a whole chapter on this in the book, but there's a couple of things I want to highlight that she said. She said, so she's very in favor of socialism. She wants to see mm -hmm. it, would like to have seen it go global. Um, but she does acknowledge that it's never worked before. And she says, this is why. She says, the reason why socialism has never worked before is because we have been unable to sever the special cord tying connection between mothers and their children. Wow. And she's right. She's right. And so there's two things. There's some good news in here because it's very hard. I think God himself has made it very hard to obscure or obliterate the actual tie between mothers and their children, which perpetuates pi private belonging and mm -hmm. orients the whole world in a private way, like I said. And, but she, it also highlights what the agenda is. So then her answer for the rest of her book is how we can sever the relationship between mothers and their babies. And uh, it's a horrific, when you read the, her whole book, it's a horrific vision. And I can, I can imagine no greater hell than a world without mothers. But what she says is that raising a child is tantamount to abusing it. And that if we were only, basically, if we're only could free, free babies from their mothers, that they would all become geniuses. This is what she says. These are her words. Wow. I mean, what so, kind of self-loathing is that? To right, say that, how about, deep, how much more uh, misogynistic can you get? Okay. But then there's, this is even more important. One of, one of the things she highlights is how we're going to break down the family and okay. the bond, therefore the bonds between parents and, and their children is through eliminating the cultural differences between the sexes. Mm. So if you think about what we're witnessing now, she wrote that in the 70s. She said, it's, feminism is about more than eliminating what she calls male privilege. It's about eliminating, eliminating the sex distinction itself. That is exactly what the transgender movement is accomplishing today is the elimination of our social acknowledgement of the, of the two sexes. You can't mm -hmm. actually eliminate them because they're inherently 
they inherently exist right by the de design of god but we cannot believe in it anymore we for we can stop honoring it both in law and in culture and then but she says the reason why we would want to do that is to destroy the family and she talks about it as a triumphal uh event when we will finally the family will basically lie on the cutting room floor bloodied and and, and broken and then we can really move forward. Like Melissa Harris Perry said, then we'll make better decisions when we deprioritize our own children and, and just think of children as everyone's. And, and then that's what this other, this book that I just held up, Sophie Lewis, that she says that people will experience more love because everyone will be like the child's mother. I'm sorry. It doesn't work that way. You can't teach people to love everyone which we should try to love everyone, but you can't teach a, a new person to love everyone before you teach them to love someone. Right. And the someone they love first is their mother. And the someone who loves them first is their mother and their father. And you can't do it the opposite way. You can't say, okay, well, we want people to love everyone so that we can't have them loving their families so much. We need to spread that love out. Oh. It doesn't grow love. It dilutes it. Yeah. They claim and the opposite, but it's it, it's simply not true. It profoundly misunderstands the very I, the, the our identity, uh, but also the the uh, like what it means to even love somebody in the first place. We love because I mean, from a Christian worldview, we love because He first loved us. We understand mm -hmm. what that's like because we were shown love. And I dare you to gather yes. one hundred random strangers from your town in a room somewhere and say, "All right, now I deeply love you, and I'm going to love you enough to show you how to love every single other person compared to your own child." Like that's that's just not going to happen. And that's a beautiful thing. It's a gift that God's given us. Um, but if you reject the notion of God and uh, you know uh, you believe in and this radical self-autonomy. I think a lot of what I read in your book and what I'm hearing from th these, these quotes that are, again, not hiding the ball whatsoever. They're being very blatant about their own agenda now, which I guess I can thank them for, for <laughs> being this open so that I can you know, fight up the armor up and fight back accordingly, um, is the idea of, of this lie about personhood, uh, about your worth. It's all related to radical autonomy. And we hear this a lot in the fight for life. Um, now they're, they've taken to admitting that the child in the womb is a person in many cases as a human being, but, uh, not as important as the woman. So this is, they, they talk about the, the living, developing human baby in the preborn state as a parasite, um, uh, mm -hmm. because what matters most is my autonomy, what I want, my hopes and dreams, my body, my choice. It is very selfish. You may notice, of course, mm -hmm. but it's based on a lie an unfulfilling lie at that about our own radical autonomy and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that is, it's at the root of that base lie from the garden that says, I can be the boss. I can be my own God. I can do what I want. If you uproot children from the stability of their homes, their parents, you divorce them from that natural love developing, like you're talking about, they don't have, they don't recognize those social and biological responsibilities to one another. They, you know, are, are not being taught the same traditional values or religious values in their home. All of that leads or toward, and, and that, understanding of being your own God, I think. And to me, that looks like it would destroy the whole world in like one generation, uh, <laughs> a real quick mm -hmm. way to tear everything down because a house divided against itself cannot stand. So I guess, how do we fight back against that? Well, the good news is yes, that we can. The good news. <laughs> so there is a lot of good. So I'll, I'll, I'll say a couple of broader things and then I want to get more specific. So obviously from what we've discussed, we need to to oppose comprehensive sexuality education in all its forms and get it out of our schools in every way possible. Eradicate it from our, from our culture, that the sexual rights ideology, we need to be aware of it and fight it effectively. That's something we just absolutely have to do. Um, there's a number of other things we can do um, legislatively to protect the family, but ultimately, kind of ironically, the answer to the war against the family is the family itself. So what we need to be doing in our homes is to be teaching our children what we believe about sex, marriage, gender, and the family. And we need to do that consistently. And we have opportunities around us all the time to talk about these issues. Of course, depending on how old your children are, you're going to tailor the discussion to their needs and abilities. But we don't, in our homes, 
That's the beauty of it. We don't have to teach what is poli politically correct. We can teach what we think is actually correct, mm -hmm. the truth to our children. And if we're regular and diligent in that, teaching with love and with per the perspective of valuing human life and being God's children and all of these things, that's powerful. And while there's no guarantee that our children are going to believe everything we say or do everything we'd want them to do, that's not my argument that we're going to, I don't say the invincible family because I think our families are not going to be in, influenced by outside culture. They will, and will suffer losses and there'll be heartache. But I say the invincible family because the family cannot be crushed. It's the thing that will always rise again. Like if everything bad happens in society, things totally fall apart, governments crumble or whatever, nations dissolve, what's going to come back? What's going to remain, first of all, and mm -hmm. what's going to rise? The family. The family, because it's inherent to our anatomy. And so um, that's a very hopeful message. And so we, as moms and dads, are put in a, a position of almost our family is our, our little realm, you know, almost our little kingdom. And we get to do in it what we think is best. And and the, the incredible thing is that most parents put in that prof profound position of power. Most parents do it well. Of course, there's some terrible examples of parents who don't do it well, but most parents do. Mm -hmm. And, and that matters. And we don't, we don't have to sit around and just wring our hands about what's happening in the schools and whatever. We need to be aware and we need to be engaged. But even if all these horrible things are happening, they don't have to happen at our house. They don't have to happen within the walls of our mm -hmm. own home. And we can rejoice in the truth and we can speak of it and we can teach it. And that is really where our true power lies. So yes, we fight publicly in the public square, but the real more important battle happens at home. Mm -hmm. Amen. And I think there are an awful lot of people, I've long said one of the silver linings of the whole COVID chaos craziness that we submitted ourselves to over the last few years has been that a lot more parents started spending time with their kids. And a lot mm -hmm. of them started becoming more aware of what was going on in the classrooms and taking more of an ownership role in their own families, stepping back into that role and not uh, outsourcing it, so to speak. Mm -hmm. I mean, homeschooling is on is on the rise. A lot more parents, in particular moms, are staying home or finding work from home options. Now, I do, and my heart goes out to the people who are in situations where they feel like they don't have other options. I think, and the maybe the blunt truth, because I just got to get real with y'all because I love you, is we have to we have to find other options. We have to stand up and be willing to um, to educate our kids, to lead our families well, to stand up and be the husbands and the wives that we are called to be, to be the examples for our kids and stop outsourcing that. And there, there really isn't, I think, any other option or excuse. Like this is our priority and this we have to get right because you, as you mentioned, Kimberly, um, the, like this, this is here, this is in our schools, the, um, the insidious nature of the comprehensive sex education. It's starting at younger and younger ages. We're talking about mm -hmm. preschool kids, like pre-K, mm -hmm. uh, kindergarten classes. If you just look at the the bills that they've enacted in Florida and all of the, the uh, outcry against them, because they were talking about very young children, like up to mm -hmm. third grade. Why on earth would you want to be talking about explicit sexual content with any child under third grade? That's a real issue. And while there may be some good teachers out there that really do care about kids and want to teach them, you know, the, the time honored truths of right and wrong, and not to mention reading, writing, arithmetic, what they're going to school for. There are some like the, all you have to do is follow libs of TikTok and discover that there, there are teachers who very blatantly put themselves as the better leader, as the better example for children and that parents are the enemy. And they're openly <laughs> saying these types of things. And if <laughs> parents go along with that, if you are if you are allowing that usurpation of your authority, you're, you're outsourcing that it's no, like you're, you're losing your kids mm -hmm. yeah. It, and, and it's putting them in the position to be preyed upon, not just given a few bad ideas to consider and it'll move in and out and oh, kids are resilient and they'll bounce back. Children mm -hmm. are literally becoming victims of, of assault, of abuse, of, of mental, uh, con massive mental confusion. And now we are, allowing them to be physically harmed because of the, in particular, the gender ideology that's in play here. So I don't think this is something that we can put off or kick the can down the road and our kids matter enough. 
but this has to shake us off the fence, shake us awake. And if we have to make those personal decisions that might make us uncomfortable, or it might be somewhat you know, inconvenient, or maybe we don't make as much money as we used to, or all those things, whatever mm -hmm. that means in your household to be present as the parent and as the authority figure in your child's life in education and reminding ourselves is we are a family as primary first and foremost value. Um, I think we have to do it. We do. And I believe, you know, families find themselves in a very wide range of situ situations and many people aren't in, in the situation they would like to be in. And I believe that with the grace and help of God, no matter what our situation is, we can meet our children's needs. We can, we might have to get very creative. It will certainly require sacrifice, but if we go looking for answers, God is going to help us find them for our family. And I also realize that, you know, I focus so much on mothers and motherhood on purpose, because I think that's a message that needs to be out there. My message isn't that mothers who work in some capacity are somehow lesser. There's, no. there's so many, so many opportunities and different ways of arranging our lives these days. Um, but for all of us, our children are and should remain our top priority. That doesn't mean we have to be with them 24 seven, but we have to be with them consistently because it matters to them and they'll trust us more and the love will be there more. The more we're with them, especially when they're very young. Mm -hmm. And so whatever situation we can meet our children's needs, we can, we can find a way we can all teach in our homes. Even if we do have to send our children to a situation or school that that isn't ideal, we can still teach at home. That's something every parent can do and we can do it effectively. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You were mentioning the, basically the joy of the family. I think that's something that we've maybe forgotten in our rush for, you know, making more money or, and mm -hmm. some of it's very, we all have to do what our specific, uh, you know, situation requires, but God has empowered us. And because I come from a position of faith, I can openly say, God gives us the strength that we need, the power that we need. And he gives us mm -hmm. the solutions at hand. We just got to silence some of those other voices that tell us the lies. We've got to get embedded in the truth and grounded in the truth such that when the culture tells us, oh, you need this thing, um, and we're falling prey to some of those marketing schemes or those lies that keep us up and say, well, maybe I'm not using my master's degree to its fullest potential or what, like what matters most are our children and the eternal significance of the everyday little things, changing their diapers, you know, teaching them left from right shoes. I've got a two-year-old. We just had cleaned up the cake from his dinosaur birthday party. And he was stomping around in these cute little furry dinosaur slippers. And he just gave everybody so much joy. And I would not have missed that for the world. I wouldn't miss that for an extra 10,000, you know, $30,000 a year, because I, there's no replacing that moment and that place in his life. Uh, and, right. and those just the beauty of that is a wonderful gift that we need to rediscover. I think what we so often think of as the menial parts of family life are really where some of the greatest gems are found. And that's really where the love grows. I feel like God made babies completely helpless for quite a long time on purpose because it's in caring for them that we come to love them, right? Isn't that the old thing? If you want mm -hmm. to love someone, serve them. Yes. Well, we're, if family life invites us into a life of daily service, really for the rest of our lives in, in some way. And it's, it's through that though, that we gain the love and the joy, you know, yes, parenthood is hard when you, there's always opposition, right? When you do the hardest thing, you also get the best part. Mm -hmm. There's this opposition in life. When you pick up the best, you also get the worst and you take them together. But I'm not giving up parenthood or motherhood because it's hard. I'm going to take both parts. I'm going to take the hard and I'm going to take the joy. And eventually the joy wins out. Mm -hmm. Most, I think most mothers would say in the end, yes, it was worth it. Yes, yes. I love it. Yes, that's the thing that matters most to me in my whole life. Well, and, and I've seen, I think, a trend that hopefully this is a glimmer of hope. I've seen a trend of of uh, folks online, in particular young people, that are using their influence for mm -hmm. uh, the rejection of, of feminism, for example, or telling young men that they need to aspire to ideals to man up, so to speak, and to kind of mm -hmm. reclaim that goodness of family life, of home life, of understanding our roles in connection with our fatherhood, motherhood, and, and being parents aspiring to that as 
as that type of wonderfully noble good. And and I I take a little bit of hope in that. I know it can go in some weird directions sometimes, but I I do see that there is a trend towards people rediscovering the the age old nobility to use your word of family and the beauty in the sacrificial love and all of the virtues that it teaches us. I I don't know. Mm-hmm. Do you see hope there? I do. I see little, uh, it, like in the spring when the flowers begin to come up, the grass begins to come up. I, I see that in our culture. And I think we're turning from the rampant materialism that, that we've kind of been stewing in and we're realizing what, what actually has meaning in our lives. And the core of it is almost always family. And so, and, and if people are interested, the last two pages of my book are practical ideas of, of what you can do to fight for the family, both in your home and and the broader world stage. So I hope I hope that is helpful to people. Not just not just it's nice that we've talked about all these platitudes about the family, but then we put them into practice in mm-hmm. in real you know meaningful ways. Is there one that people could do today? Well, yes. Speak positively about being a parent. Mm-hmm. When my I had I had four little I have five kids. Four are now girls in college and I have a little six-year-old boy. So when my four girls were little and I would take them all in the cart to the grocery store and people would often make comments just to, you know, oh, I see it's, I see your hands are full. That must be tough or whatever. And I found myself kind of commiserating at times, like, cause it was hard. Sure. And then I realized that my children were hearing the way that I was talking about motherhood and about them and about our relationship. And I decided to make my language different. And when I spoke of them to others and about our family, I said things like, yes, we have a lot of fun at our Mm. house. So we can start talking positively about motherhood and fatherhood today and not going into not being baited into the social media things about, you know, you know, the negative parts of parenthood, which, which are so easy to fall into because yes, they're there, but let's talk about the positive. Let's model to our young girls and our daughters that motherhood is worth their time. It's worth their life's best efforts. Because if they don't get that message from us, I don't see them getting it from anywhere. Right. Very true. The Invincible Family, Kimberly Ells, has been an excellent guest. The subtitle makes you uh, stand up and take notice and hopefully armor up why the global campaign to crush motherhood and fatherhood can't win. And I agree. Amen. Kimberly, it's been uh, amazing to have you. Thank you so much for delving into all of this, the research that I know can't be easy and standing on the front lines of this fight. I highly recommend people check out The Invincible Family. Uh, Where can people go for more information and getting the book? Thank you. My website is invinciblefamily.com. And the easiest place to find it is on Amazon. And I would love it if people followed me on Twitter, just at, at Kimberly Ells. Speaking of glimmers of hope in dark places, follow Kimberly on Twitter. (laughs) The Invincible Family is the name of the book. Um, Get it, armor up and be prepared at... I love how, um, when you trust the, when you trust what works, which is God's good design, just beautiful things happen. And it doesn't take that much. We make things so much more complicated than they need to be. What if, what if we rediscovered what it was to be a wife and a mom and a husband and a dad, and we could raise our kids in peace. What if all that, what, what if we tried that? What if we just go back to what's worked for the last several (laughs) thousand years of human history? Thank you, Kimberly, for all of your hard work uh, and, again, for standing on this hill. We really need you. Thank you so much. If you are inspired by this discussion, I highly recommend you check out The Invincible Family. Um, We know and believe, if, if we believe what we say we believe, then we know that the thrashings that we see all around us are um, of a defeated foe and that the enemy knows that uh, he, he can't win this fight, but he's going to take down and attack all the things that God loves in the meantime. So what we can do is trust the words of Christ and his promises. I've been thinking about Matthew 18 during the course of this conversation. So I think I'll, I'll end with this, that when the disciples came to Jesus, they were saying, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, right? Because they're thinking about power, authority, position. He called a little child up. Do you remember this picture? A picture of Jesus calling up a little child and brought them, put them, put this child right in the middle of them and said, truly, I say to you, whoever, unless you turn and become like 
this child, like little children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like a child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever receives such a one in my name receives me. But if you cause one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it's better to have a millstone tied around his neck and thrown in the depths of the sea. So I think that speaks for itself. We have to be ready to protect our kiddos and and the kiddos of this entire generation but we do that by loving them we do that to to give them a, a working knowledge and understanding of the truth of who god is as well the ultimate truth and show them what beauty looks like show them what love looks like what sacrifice and service look like and call them speak in speak light and truth into their lives and and the way god designed them to be their wonderful potential that we believe in them and that god made them put them here for a purpose and we love them enough to hold them to to that standard and there's there's just so many wonderful things that i'm so glad that I had a family, that I had a mom and dad that loved me and cared about me to put me out into the world with that type of foundation. And if there's a kid that is in your life, maybe you don't have children right now, or you're a, a grandparent, maybe you don't see them as often, you have prime place in this mission to find the kids in your life that you have influence with and you can mentor them and love them too. And that is a way that we can make a difference for generations here and now. Like I always say, we have a mission, so let's be about it. Thanks for listening to FaithWorks Live. What does love look like? Love means serving those who are truly in need, and that is what they do at Agape Pregnancy Resource Center. That's really what they're all about, helping, loving, serving women in crisis pregnancy situations with free pregnancy testing, STD testing, ultrasounds, and so much more. For practical needs, um, they have turned whole lives and whole family trees. It's amazing to see what they're doing right here in our very own community for women in need. They provide free services because they believe that women deserve the truth about their bodies and about their babies. And when women know they're not alone, they can fix the crisis and carry them through the pregnancy. They empower women to choose life. And like I said, whole families are here because of the work that they do at Agape. There are many ways to get involved, practical ways for you to live out your pro-life through Agape. Get involved with their important ministry at agapedsm.com. Click the tab that says Get Involved and find out their current needs and ways that you can help meet those needs and care for women in crisis and save babies at the same time. It's agapedsm.com.